Now that we have prepared all of our input data for our predictor variables and our dependent variable with tr some transformations, subsetting out some of the data, let's take a look at the correlation structure in our data. Now we are not really interested in how the GOID is correlated with other variables as this is just an index for our data set. So we'll take our transform data set and we'll use the pipe just to deselect this one when we create a correlation matrix. So let's create that correlation matrix. Let's just take a look at what that is. And so here we have a matrix with each of our variables across the top and across the side and in one-to-one -one relationships where the same variable occurs. But then we can see our positive and negative relationships. Now there are other ways to view this and in the core plot library we have the core plot function. You may need to install this library and here we can create a nice figure that shows the strength of the correlation based on the size of our circle and then positive correlations are represented from light blue to dark blue based on the strength and then from light red to dark red for negative correlations. For example, we can see that the number of rooms and the number of bedrooms are very positively correlated, which we would expect. In class, we've discussed multiple approaches for variable selection. We talked about the manual approach, a stepwise approach, or all subsets regression. We will be using the manual approach in this tutorial. So we'll begin with the strongest predictor variable based on our correlation plot, which appeared to be median age and we'll add in other variables. So let's just start with the log value by median age. Now we can take a look at our model. So it gives us our intercept and our coefficient. We have the summary function available to us, which provides more information about our model. And we just use our model name or our model variable that we saved. So it talks, shows our residuals, our minimum to our maximum, median, first and third quartile. We have our coefficients. We have the coefficient estimate, the standard error, our t-value, and then our p-value, which is based off of our t-value here. In this scenario, both of these are less than 0 0.05. So we know that they're statistically significant. We also look at our overall model. So we have our R squared and our adjusted R squared. In this scenario, we only have one predictor, so they're pretty much the exact same. And we can say that about 36% of the variation in house value or the log of house value can be predicted by median age of the house. And we see that our p-value is statistically significant or less than 0 0.05. So this model would be something we could start to work forward with. Now let's recall the assumptions that we must meet in our linear regression model. We want the mean of our residuals to be close or zero or very, very close to zero. We want homoscedasticity of the residuals or equal variance around the fitted values. We don't want high multicollinearity. The independent variables or variable that we're using and the residuals should be uncorrelated. We want to make sure that our predictor variables have some variability or variance is positive. The number of observations must be greater than the number of independent variables. We need normality of our residuals. And our last one, which is particularly important to us as geographers, is we want no autocorrelation of the residuals. If we're working with temporal data, this is temporal autocorrelation. If we're working with spatial data, this is spatial autocorrelation. 
without really doing any more work, uh, given that we've looked at our summary of our data, we know that the variability or the variance in x values is positive. Because remember our summary, we had ranges in all of our values. And we know that we have far more observations or rows in our data set than we do independent variables. We can quickly check that the mean of our residuals is zero. So if you take the mean, give it our model, and then we can access the residuals of our model object with the dollar sign operator. So just what that looks like, we have our model. So there's our model. We use the dollar sign operator. We have a number of different items that we can obtain, such as our coefficients. Our residuals. So here is a vector of our residuals. That's pretty messy, but it gives you the idea. So this is comparing the actual value and the fitted value from our model for each of our observations. So the original y value and then the predicted y value. And it's the differences between those. So we can just take the mean of all of those and we are at a value that is very, very close to zero. Now you've noticed, or you may have noticed that R is giving us values in scientific notation. For some of us, that is fine to work with. With others, we might find that a bit difficult to interpret, especially as we're learning all of these different functions and ways to use the model. So we can actually change this by changing one of the options in R. And here it is. And if we just give it this number, nothing's going to happen. But now when we call our model, we can see that, yes, this value is very, very close to zero, and it's in a different notation. If you want, you can set it back by setting it to zero. But for the rest of the tutorial, let's, let's remove scientific notation to make it a little bit easier to interpret some of our values as we're learning about this. Now, we have a couple plots that we generate by default when we plot the model object in R. I'm just going to create, allow for a out, uh, plot output of two rows and two columns. So putting those four plots together and we'll call the plot function on our model object. So here we have our residuals versus fitted and our scale location plots. Now these are useful for stressing if heteroscedasticity of the residuals is occurring. So here we have our fitted values in our model and then our residuals or just our standardized residuals here. And what we observe and what's actually kind of handy about this plot is it labels, gives row numbers, row IDs, to the values that may be driving any sort of issue within our plot. We also have these two plots here that we won't be discussing at the moment. Now it looks like from here, observation 402, 471. And then if I look at this Cook's distance plot, I can also see that they've highlighted 405, that these three values are causing some issues in our plot. Um, we maybe want to take a deeper look at what's going on. So we can extract these rows from our data using the slice function. Okay. And in the slice function, we just need to give it row IDs. Okay, so we're using our transform tibble, and we'll use a slice, and let's just see what we get. Now what I notice, and since I've been working with this data for some time, I see that these are very high median ages for the homes, okay? and some of them were outliers that we have left in our data. And that if you pull, go back to your box plot of median age, you can kind of see that these extreme values exist. So let's subset out these values because we know that they are affecting our model and they are some extreme values and it's only three census tracts. So we're okay to remove this because we're not really interested in some, in a regression model that just is really focused on some of these extremely old neighborhoods or census tracts, we want a model that really represents everything in the San Diego area, excluding these three 
census tracts. So how I do that is I'm using the same slice function that I use to subset them, but instead of retaining them, if I use my negative sign in front of the vector of row IDs, I can just remove those specific row IDs. And I'll save it to a new variable called sd underscore trans, which was transformed sub subset. Okay. So when we run this, we can then see that if we want to look at the number of rows, we can use this quick function here. So we'll look at the number of rows in our first one, in our original data, 593. And once we remove these, let's make sure everything makes sense. Now we have 590 rows. So this makes sense so we can carry on. Let's do some more model fitting. Uh, first, we want to fit the new model now with the subset of data. Since we've removed some outlying observations, we'll need to refit our model. So I'm going to call this model two. So now model two, our coefficients are still statistically significant. And we can see that we've removed that scientific notation here. And our overall model is still statistically significant. Let's see what happens when we plot our model. Well, now our scale versus location is looking quite a bit better. And we'll, we'll move on from here. And you know this is acceptable in our scenario. If we were really working this model and you know, spending a lot more time, we might want to think about what's going on in this little scenario right, right about here. But for the most part, that red line is pretty flat across the fitted values. Let's add another variable to our model. So we know that median age was useful. Let's see if number of bedrooms improves our model. So I will give it a new model name and add number of bedrooms to my formula. I see that, yes, that new variable is statistically significant. It has increased our adjusted R squared by about 0.04. And now we're at 0.48, which is 48% of the variability in the log of our housing value is explained by our median age and the number of bedrooms. Let's make sure that we didn't introduce any heteroscedasticity to that model. Doesn't seem like much has changed. Okay, let's try adding another variable. No, turns out the log variable of the number of houses without, or sorry, actually the proportion of houses without kitchens, completed kitchens, is not significant in our model. And what we see, we go back, our adjusted R squared has actually decreased and this is accounting for the increase in the number of variables. And it's decreasing our R squared because we've added a variable that does not that is not statistically significant. Let's try another one instead of the log of kitchen. Let's look at the number of rooms. Okay. So we see something that's interesting. The number of rooms is now statistically significant. However, the number of bedrooms is no longer statistically significant. And if we go back to our original model, the number of bedrooms was increasing the price, which makes sense. As a house has more bedrooms, the price should increase. But what has happened is that sign has now flipped on our coefficient. So our coefficient has now become negative. And what this would indicate to myself is that we have some issues of multicollinearity in our model. Since this has created a non-significant coefficient, we wouldn't retain them anyway in the model. But let's just take a look at the, one of our other assumptions of multicollinearity. And we can test this by using the variance inflation function, VIF. As, which is part of the car package. So we can load the library car, 
and our model was model five. So let's run this. And so it attached the package, so it's just giving us some information here, and it's saying that the object recode, the function recode is masking the function recode in the dplyr package, and that the function sum of the car library is masking the per package sum. Uh, so just if you're going to work with these two functions, you just need to keep that in mind. Let's just rerun that since the package has already been loaded, just to get a simpler output. Now, variance inflation, there's no exact number. We have a couple rules of thumb. In our course, we'll be working with anything you know, greater than four for variance inflation. Uh, we want to really think about that. And so when we have both the number of bedrooms and the number of rooms, when we look at their VIF values, they are much, much larger than four. So spend some time, and I want you to build a few more models on your own, and look at the summaries and look at the plots of those. And then we'll continue with model three in the next video that we created.